Welcome to an oh, thank you. <laughs> Welcome everyone to another Housing Justice Forum of Making Housing and Community Happen. Uh, this evening we will look at LA County Measure A, State Proposition 33, and Measure R, which covers the Pasadena Unified School District, which includes Altadena and the city of Sierra Madre, as well as the city of Pasadena. Uh, and we'll go in that order, Measure A, Prop 33, and then Measure R. So our first two presenters will be Andrea Vokos of United Way, who will tell us about uh, Measure A, and then B. Rooney from Pasadena Tenants Union will tell us about Prop 33. And then I will do a short presentation on Measure R. Before we get to that, though, Anthony is going to bring an inspirational reflection, and then I will report uh, briefly on what's happening at MHCH. So Anthony? Anthony, uh, come and inspire us. Okay, good evening, everybody. So Friday, October 4th, was St. Francis Day. And I'd like to honor Francis and also the only Pope to adopt his name. In the spirit of his namesake, Pope Francis has been an advocate for the poor and unhoused much of his life. He said that wealthy people with expensive homes should give up some of their tax benefits to help those who lack affordable housing. He said that it's not justifiable to justify to subsidize higher income homeowners while others in the country lack affordable housing. Pope Francis has also said that housing is a human right, and he's put his money where his heart is. He's directed the conversion of a 19th century palace next to the Vatican into a shelter for people experiencing homelessness. And when he became Pope, he often visited people who were homeless and uh he established World Day of the Poor in 2016 to bring attention to poverty, especially in wealthy countries. Now, of course, Pope Francis is simply taking to heart and putting into practice the teachings, not only of his namesake, but also of Jesus, who came to bring good news to the poor. And that is also the goal of MHCH. So thank you very much. Man, thank you, Anthony. That inspiring word. It's good to hear that. Um, all right. I'm going to share briefly here on uh, what's happening at MHCH. Hopefully you all can see that and put it in slideshow mode here. So what's happening at MHCH? So um, making housing and community happen, we have a very small staff. We're all part-time. And in fact, some of our part-time staff are not paid. So it's a small staff, um, but we have many volunteers and some of them are on four different teams. So I want to talk about uh, the four different teams. Uh, first, our safe parking team. Um, about 15,000 people are living in their vehicles in Los Angeles County. But until a few years ago, there was no safe parking program in the whole San Gabriel Valley. But we started one uh, with Trinity Lutheran Church and Foothill Unity Center, which at this point is still uh, servicing our, our, our safe parking program. So um, in our safe parking program, there are 10 safe places to park. Uh, the participants get access to a bathroom, uh, including a shower and also a break room in the church. Uh, they get case management services. Uh, they get mental health treatment, referrals to other resources, and permanent housing. In fact, 11 of them have been permanently housed through our program. They've graduated and been permanently housed. Now, uh, at one point, there were 50 people on the waiting list. We know at least two parkers waited one year to get into the program. Uh, so there's a need for other sites. So we're often looking for other sites. Uh, so hopefully um, uh, we're told that All Saints Church uh, is looking to start one. Uh, the, the provider will be Showers of Hope and that will be a 25 uh, Parker site. And uh, until Mike told me just a few minutes ago, I thought Arcadia, we're gonna have one in Arcadia, but I guess uh, at, the, at this point that's, that's not happening. But uh, we're very uh, thankful to his group uh, for continuing to work on on uh, solutions in Arcadia for, for housing and homelessness. Um, next is our congregational land team. And this is a team that consults with congregations that want to have affordable housing built on their land. So they are grant funded. Uh, this is a collaborative with LA Voice, and they are uh, grant funded to do feasibility studies. So they can uh, do a feasibility studies with a congregation to show what is feasible on their land, give, give them options. And when the church finally chooses an option and decides to, to do it, they can also help write a request for proposal. 
and, and put it out for developers to respond. And then they can also inter- help the, the, the congregation interview developers to make sure they get the one that's that's right for them. So that's what this team does. So um, at this point, over 100 congregations across Southern California have shown interest in this and in, in, in these services. And 35 of them have completed the classes, the prep classes that we require uh, in order uh, for, to, to do further consultation. Uh, our team has done 30 feasibility studies and has taken three congregations all the way to the point where they have uh, an agreement with a developer. Um, there, we also are apprenticing uh, or mentoring teams in other parts of the country. Um, that includes, uh, see, Washington State, Colorado, Texas, Northern California. And then I, I saw today that there are also some other teams in other parts of the country that are emerging as well. So there, so teams in other parts of the country are being mentored to do what our team does here in Southern California. Uh, then we have our affordable and supportive housing advocates team. And this is our main advocacy team here in Pasadena. Um, and some of our major victories over the last couple of years, one of them is here, Heritage Square South. And that is 69 units of permanent supportive housing for unhoused seniors. So we won that in 2018. Uh, the land that it's built on is owned by the city. And there was uh, a church's chicken there, but most of the land was vacant. And there were unhoused seniors that were sleeping there. So we started a campaign, started with a prayer vigil at the site. Then some of us slept over at the site to bring attention to it. Then we did an email campaign. We gathered petition signatures from the neighborhood to show that the neighborhood wanted it. Uh, And then we packed out city council meetings. Uh, The churches came out. uh, The pastors came out and stayed late into the night. And we won this at 11 o'clock at night at a city council meeting. That was back in 2018. And it, since then, it's taken all this time to you know, get all the permits, get the funding together and get it built. But this May, if, this past May, uh, 2024, it finally opened. And at least 69 unhoused seniors were able to move into this beautiful new building. Uh, I say at least 69 because they were allowed to double up if they had a partner or something. Uh, So I'm not sure what the count is, but at least 69 unhoused seniors were able to move into this beautiful new building. Um, It's on the corner of Orange Grove and Fair Oaks, if you know Pasadena. Um, After that, we won 100 units of uh, affordable senior housing in our civic center right there by City Hall, right next to the old YMCA. Uh, And half of that will be for unhoused seniors as well. Uh, that just finally got approved this past May. We won that campaign in 2021, but it, we uh, uh, it finally got a pr- got all its approvals and everything th- through the design commission and everything this past May, and it has not yet broken ground. Um, so we've we've done a lot of uh, we this team has won a lot of victories. We, uh, we too many to name all of them. But what we've done this last year we, is we've worked on getting affordable housing on school land. So the Pasadena Unified School District has closed uh, 11 campuses in the last 18 years, and we want to get them to use some of those for uh, affordable housing. Uh, So we organized this past year, and we've been successful in helping the Pasadena Unified School District vote twice to move forward with affordable housing at the old Roosevelt Elementary School site. so uh, at currently, the, the current configuration that they're, they're looking at is 115, uh, 115 units. Uh, there'll be anything from one to four bedrooms, most of them two and three bedrooms. The lowest ones will rent at $600 per month. So it's really low. And uh, 55 of them will rent at $1,500 or below. Um, so this will be for staff housing, staff and their families. Uh, there are a lot of school districts. Teachers are not paid that much, especially beginning teachers. But uh, there are other staff that are paid even less. Uh, There's some staff that make barely above minimum wage. Uh, we were told this past year that a couple of janitors are living in their vehicles. Uh, and then you have other staff that are commuting from far away. So we want to provide uh, housing for them. And um, and and if they if if they if those that are living, you know. Are commuting for far away. If they move back to Pasadena, then their uh, their kids could go to Pasadena schools, which would could help with our declining enrollment. So we really need this. And they're they're saying that if they're successful with this one, then they're going to look at a second site for um, 
for PUSD families, not just for staff, but for uh, families of children who go to uh, PUSD schools. So that's what that's uh, what we're doing. And, and, this, and the school board has, has voted twice overwhelmingly recently uh, to go forward with this. Um, next, our North Fair Oaks Empowerment Team. This is a team that works on North Fair Oaks north of Washington Boulevard. And it's really the most neglected part of our city. Their motto is beautify and not gentrify. And they want to do that with signage, more trees, sidewalk repairs, and affordable housing, and something called complete streets with, that makes streets uh, good for people using all modes of transportation, pedestrians, cyclists, people using public transportation. Um, and they have this vision plan that's been written up. It's actually now been formally written up by the Arroyo Group, which is a planning firm here in Pasadena, because the principal of the Arroyo Group now lives in that neighborhood. In fact, he lives in affordable housing in that neighborhood. So he's put this uh, into a, a whole vision plan with all those elements I just mentioned. And the idea is to help uh, shape the city's specific plan for North Fair Oaks. The city has specific plans for various parts of the city that come up every 20 years. And the specific plan for North Fair Oaks is going to be finalized next year. So we want our vision plan, all those things, complete streets, you know, affordable housing, all that written into the specific plan. Um, so we have a congregational network of more than 20 congregations that participate in MHCH. If you want your congregation to be part of the network, contact me, Bert Newton, Bert at makinghousinghappen.org um, or 626-993-7958. Uh, one more thing that we do, we do uh, one-day housing justice institutes. Uh, these are city-specific. Uh, and uh, Jill and uh, sometimes somebody... Uh, with her go into they go into a city uh they're invited into a city by a group there and they do months of preparation and then they do this one day housing justice institute so they do months of prep where they look at what you know uh, what strategies are good for that city they look at the history of that city what strategies are good for that city to do housing justice to increase affordable housing and then they do this one day housing institute and then the idea is that a local housing justice group uh, is formed in that city and continues to work on housing justice in that city. Um, if you want uh, to invite, uh, to have one of those in your city, then contact Jill Shook. Uh, her email is jill at makinghousinghappen.org. You can also do it jill at makinghousinghappen.com. Either one works, whether it's .org or .com. Um, uh, for me, it's only .org, but for Jill, it's .com or .org. Just want to clarify that. All right, so that is, um, why can't I find my cursor here? That is what is happening. Can I make a quick statement? Yeah, go ahead while I'm finding my cursor. Okay. Yeah, one other very exciting thing about the North Fair Oaks Empowerment Team's effort is um, to, to bring back beauty through public art. And so just this last weekend, we started a mural uh, by a wonderful African-American artist. Um, and it's gonna, if you wanna go see it in action, you can go this Saturday. Um, it's on the corner of uh, Fair Oaks and Montana on the side of the real meat market. So that will features all kinds of historic folks from that community, like um, Jackie Robinson and, and many more. And so um, come check it out. It's, it's gonna, it's really gonna be a fabulous mural. With the QR yeah. code where you can learn about books. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just interrupted her, but she was saying QR codes. There's going to be QR codes on this mural where you can uh, put your phone up to it and then it'll take you to a site where you learn about the people and places on that mural. It's going to, it's really exciting. Go up and, yeah, go up and see uh, Jason working on that. Uh, he's doing it on, on the next few Saturdays, right? Yeah. And then okay. the next three and and then also our congregational land team has a cohort that starts this Saturday. So if your congregation is considering this, talk to me about it. Thanks. Excellent. So all right. So now for our two main presentations. First up, Andrea Vokos will present on Measure A. Andrea is uh, Housing Coalitions Manager of United Way of Los Angeles. Uh, she was born and raised in Orange County. Andrea began organizing in high school working on climate change, poverty, LGBTQIA plus campaigns. 
Uh, she credits growing up in a low-income immigrant household with her early political awakening. Uh, she has a BA in journalism from the New School in New York City and was an organizer in Brooklyn, New York with the Democratic Socialists of America. Until recently, she worked as an organizer for LA Voice. So Andrea, take it away. Thank you so much, Bert. Uh, and thank you so much, everyone, for being on here tonight. Um, <clears throat> I'm really excited to get to share about uh, Measure A with you all. Um, it's going to be on the ballot this November. And so uh, I'm just really excited to share. Uh, this was a measure that was put together by community experts um, and folks with lived experience. And we were able to collect over 400,000 uh, signatures to get this added to the ballot, far exceeding the minimum that was required from the county. Um, and yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> um, so a few things have helped um, helped Measure A form, essentially. So uh, we've learned lots of things since Measure H was passed back in 2017, which was another um, uh, tax initiative as well. Um, so we've learned that people have been ending their homelessness since then. Uh, over 100,000 people across LA County have ended their homelessness permanently, and that's more than the amount of people that fit into either the Rose Bowl or the SoFi Stadium. So it's actually quite a lot of folks. Um, but at the same time, we're still not investing enough countywide um, on homeless, on preventing homelessness. It's only less than 4% of our total county um, budget. Um, and because of that, uh, because of the, the, the short, the small amount of funding, and in addition to that, and budget cuts that happen every year, um, there's a lot of impact. So we see some consequences are, we have almost 7,000 uh, unused and offline long-term board and care beds, beds that could be utilized, but simply there isn't the funding uh, consistent, sustainable funding to operate them. And at the same time, we've learned that we're still uh, vastly short of the amount of affordable housing units that we need in the county. Um, we need over half a million units of affordable housing to meet with the demand uh, that we have for our folks in the county as well. Um, and we've learned that we can't just have um, these fragmented approaches um, where city by city, there are some solutions, some don't. We need to be able to have a countywide approach since um, homelessness is a countywide problem and the risk of falling into homelessness is something that impacts folks in all across the county in all 88 cities. Um, we need to be able to find new ways to build affordable housing at a lower cost and at a much faster rate so folks can get housed sooner. Um, and we need to be able to have a long-term plan to be able to do this. So Measure H, uh, it's only a 10-year measure. It's going to be from, uh, it's going to end in 2027, um, whereas Measure A will exist in perpetuity. <clears throat> so essentially what Measure A is, is uh, repeal and replace of Measure H. So it's keeping the things that have worked well in Measure H, but also addressing the gaps that are there and improving on them. And so with that, the three main things with Measure A is that it's going to produce more housing we can afford, provide more mental health care, and provide more accountability as well. Um, and I'll get into those. Um, and the large overarching thing with Measure A is homelessness prevention. Because if we don't stop the inflow of people falling into homelessness in, in the first place, then it's going to be a constant forever uphill battle. Um, and yeah, there's a lot at stake. Um, so as I mentioned, Measure H, it ends in 2027. And right now, over 49,000 people across the county are receiving housing or services thanks to the funds for Measure H. But uh, once it ends, if we don't take action now to at the very least preserve the current funding, um, all 49,000 people are going to lose the housing or services. For many, that's going to be a death sentence. I mean, let's be honest, that's going to be a death sentence for many people that rely on these services. For many people, that's going to be them automatically becoming unhoused again. And experts say that there'd be a 28% increase in homelessness as well. So there's the really toxic risk of having um, more people falling into homelessness and less service providers on the streets to be able to help as well, since the funds also cover um, homeless service providers and uh, 
and, and nonprofits that provide services as well. So as far as what the measure is going to do, it's going to do a lot of amazing things. Um, so I mentioned mental health treatment. It's going to be connecting folks that have serious mental illness that are living on the streets and connecting them with effective treatment. Um, it's going to make housing more affordable by, in addition to creating new affordable housing units and uh, tripling the current budget. Um, it's also going to be converting already existing naturally occurring affordable housing, and it's also going to be extending current, uh, affordable housing uh, covenants that exist. Um, for preventing homelessness, it's going to uh, increase the investment in emergency rental assistance by five times um, for a lot of folks. And it's that extra $100 or $200 that you're short. That's the cause that's for you to fall into homelessness. So by having this program and higher investment, it's going to help prevent many folks from falling into homelessness. Um, it's, oh, sorry, it's pre preserving the services that I mentioned previously. And then in addition to that, um, it's a, another difference is that it's creating five legally required outcomes that need to be met. Um, and it's going to be seen by an over citizen oversight committee. And there are consequences if uh, programs aren't being effective. Um, another Great. Another few great pluses is that this is, uh, in addition to creating well-paying union jobs to, you know, construct the housing, it's also going to provide competitive wages for our folks that are doing this life-saving, crucial work on the ground, our service providers as well, because we, a lot of providers themselves um, are also at risk of falling into homelessness as well. As far as how it works, um, I mentioned there are uh, legally required outcomes that need to be met. The next slide has it a bit more specifically, but each goal has to meet specific metrics and deadlines. And essentially, if there are any programs that aren't being effective or achieving their goals, funding will then be reallocated to programs that actually are being effective. So there are consequences, and we're ensuring that our money is being used uh, properly to help the most people. And these were uh, the five legally required outcomes. So you can see here, it includes increasing the number of people permanently leaving homeless, homelessness, increasing the number of people moving from encampments into permanent housing. Housing is a human right. We all deserve safe, secure, permanent, clean housing. Um, increasing the number of affordable housing units in the LA County. It's also gonna be reducing the number of people with mental illness or substance use disorder experiencing homelessness. So. You know, the trauma of being unhoused, having that compounded with having a serious mental illness and or substance use disorder, I can't imagine how difficult life must be. And we all deserve, again, safe, clean, secure, permanent housing, um, no matter what our circumstances are. And we want to be able to provide extra support for those that need extra support. And the final one would be reducing the number of people falling into homelessness. This is really key. Um, this would be the first time that there would be a legal requirement countywide to reduce the number of people falling into homelessness. So it's really important we put this into law. So this is um, the allocation um, of how the, this is the, sorry, this is a summary of how the allocations would be done for the funding um, with the funds from the measure. 60% would be going towards homeless services and mental health. The reason that's so high is because Funding for homeless services are not guaranteed. I've learned from this new job at United Way that it's constant battle from zero, starting from zero every year. There are constant budget cuts. Just this year alone, there was $350 million cut from the budget. Um, and so since we have the largest unhoused population in the country, we wanna be able to reflect that in the, and really invest in that as well. And uh, included in that 60% is 15% going uh, towards the local solutions fund, which uh, would encourage all 88 cities in the county to participate, uh, working directly with cities to uh, create um, uh, homelessness prevention programs. And we have this other large chunk going to affordable housing. This would be funding La Casa, which is the Los Angeles County Affordable Housing Solutions Agency. And this agency is seeking to have just single source funding for uh, building housing, which would drastically lower the cost and speed up the rate that um, housing is being built. And then you can see the other percentages here as well of how the funding will be allocated. 
Now, here's the big piece that a lot of people always have the, the question on. <laughs> so the funding source for the measure. So measure A is repealing uh, and replacing the sales tax that measure H had. So, so measure H was a, is a quarter cent sales tax. Currently, 82 out of 88 cities in the county are paying into it. However, this is going to be removing that and instead having it be a half cent uh, sales tax. So for most of the county, it'll only be a quarter of a cent increase. However, for cities including Compton, Long Beach, Linwood, Pico Rivera, and Santa Monica and Southgate, those cities will be paying a half cent since they haven't been paying into Measure H. And since this was put together by community uh, experts, people who have experience, um, it's not because of that. Um, it doesn't apply to a lot of important crucial things that um, would really negatively impact a lot of folks that a lot of working class families, folks that are struggling economically. So because of that, it doesn't apply to groceries, gas, EBT purchases, WIC, menstrual products, diapers, rent, medication. In fact, it's, it doesn't apply to around 75% of our regular day-to-day -day spending that we have. And it's going to mostly apply to tourists. And considering we have the World Cup and the Olympics coming to LA, might as well make some money from <laughs> that chaos, right? <laughs> uh, so I think it's something good to consider. Um, and as far as you know, individual impact, it's around $2.50 a month for someone that's low income. For a more average income, it's like $5 a month. So essentially less than a cup of coffee. Um, and there's a real strong intersection between housing, racial and environmental justice. Um, so, um, you know, it's it should come to no surprise that we have a really his, uh, awful historic practice of redlining. And we see effects like that through today with the zoning that we have. And because of uh, because of that, we have certain communities, certain neighborhoods, um, people being closer together and it's lower quality of, you know, air, water, things like that. And we also know the impact that urban sprawl has on the environment. And uh, since La Casa is going to be funded by this, La Casa is... Uh, going to be financing housing along transit corridors um, and confronting housing segregation that exists, addressing the lack of affordable housing in high resource communities. There's a lot of common questions, but I'll just answer the most important one just for the sake of time. How is this different from the previous sales tax? So I mentioned a few. This was put together by community experts. It wasn't put together by politicians. Um, this is going to be existing in perpetuity. It's not just one 10 year measure. And also with that, it could also always be, um, people could also vote to ha have it removed at some point. Not that I'm at all encouraging that, but there is also that as well to, to know. Um, it's, you know, providing funding specifically for mental health, uh, sorry, mental health care for supporting uh, folks with serious mental illness and substance use disorder as well. Um, there's strong accountability in this that's written into it that wasn't included in Measure H. Um, and so there's going to be a citizen oversight committee uh, that's going to be overseeing uh, the, the five goals that need to be met each year. So there's a lot of differences with this. And we have a lot of supporters. We have uh, over 250 supporters from different individuals, organizations, elected officials, um, unions, faith communities, including Making Housing and Community Happen, uh, which has also endorsed. And we just received endorsements from the, both the LA Times and La Opinion, which is uh, the largest um, Spanish uh, daily newspaper in Southern California as well. Um, and so if you're wondering what you can do, there's a ton that you can do. And this is actually the right time to ask what you can do uh, because we're doing campaign voter engagement and I'm overseeing phone banking actually. Um, and so we're doing uh, weekly phone banks on Tuesdays to, uh, and Thursdays from 5 to 8 p.m. Our goal is to make 250,000 calls. We've currently reached 21% uh, of the goal so far, but we need more calls. We need more folks. And you can see here on the side, um, not on the first question, not a lot of people are familiar with measure eight. They're not familiar that it's on the ballot. But once, once we're able to share information, we have uh, almost 50% strong support, and then we have almost 17% leaning support. 
So once people actually hear about the measure, they're most likely going to support it than not. And it's uh, up to us to let people know that this is on the ballot. So the phone banks really do matter. Um, and then we're going to be doing, oh, sorry. And you can do that by signing up on events.yesona.la. Um, and um, organizations and groups, you can adopt a phone bank. So you can choose a night and invite everyone to phone bank that night. Um, a lot of organizations are doing that. It's really fun. And then we're going to be doing uh, Get Out the Vote canvassing the last two Saturdays before Election Day and Election Day as well. Uh, more details to come on that. Um, and then, yeah, other ways to help. You can endorse the measure. If you so choose to feel inclined to give an individual donation, you can do so by visiting yesona.la. Or you can also follow us on social media to stay up to date and see all of our different supporters um but yeah thank you so much that's um that's the information that i have and yeah i'm happy to answer any questions if there happens to be time yeah so if you could um if you have any questions if you could use um uh your the, the raise hand um th thing i think it's on reactions isn't it yeah on reactions you can um is it raise is that where it is wait a minute yeah uh, under your reactions, you can raise your hand. If you want to have a question, if you could use that, uh, that would help. Great. Mike. Andrea, thank you for the presentation. Very interested about the accountability. I, I love that part of it. But the one part is if one is not doing well, more recent scores to the other. So what if like number three, increased number of affordable housing is not going well, all the other money goes elsewhere, then we don't have affordable housing. What? That's a problem. Is that true? I mean, I'm just saying, if it's failing, no money goes to affordable housing? Oh, um, so, I mean, it would be with specific programs, not that there wouldn't be any money for affordable housing. Nice. Um, yeah, so it would be for, like, specific programs. So, you know, there's a lot of different organizations that would be involved. Um, so it would be things like that. Um, but, no, we absolutely need funding for affordable housing. And, in fact, something I, I, sh I forgot to mention is with the pie chart that I shared, that's also flexible. Let's say that, you know, we're able to secure and, and lower um, – are, you know, the amount of people that are unhoused, which actually this year was the first time in six years that the homeless count had a lower, that we actually decreased the number of people that were unhoused. Um, you know, let's say that it got to a better point. There, There is flexibility for more funding than to go to affordable housing or to other things or vice versa. Maybe there needs to be even more funds into homeless services. So there is flexibility there as well. Okay. But yeah, no, that we wouldn't stop. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's like a huge component. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question, though. Thank you. Excellent. Any other? Oh, uh, Carolyn. Yeah, my my question is, like you said, measure A. I haven't seen it on in any of um ballot in any of my books and things. So where would I where would I see it to be able to read up on it? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we are also sending, uh, sorry, I'm like losing my voice. We are sending out, uh, we've sent, started sending out mailers to different households. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, um, you can visit yesona.la. Uh, that's our website. And we also have, there's also measureafacts.com as well, uh, where you can also read more. Um, and then, yeah, uh, you know, LA Times endorsement. Um, I can share that as well um here um and then so my question yeah. so it's not in my general election propositions in 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 this in this booklet that i that i've got that i've been going through it has um 13 in there but i i haven't seen anything for a um i think it might be for statewide if i'm not mistaken because i think i looked through and i i don't think i saw it either but i think that might be for statewide but it is on the ballot um, I ha I'll have to double check actually, okay. but yeah. So Andrea, you're saying that it's in a different part of the, the booklet that we we were saying? I can't remember. I'd have to, I'd have to find the book. I don't have it like in front of me, but I think it might just be statewide. 
things because like things like 13 and stuff like that, like that's, that is, I believe that's statewide, but this is for the county specifically. Um, but I, I don't, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm not entirely sure. On the sample ballot, it's right after the county judges. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> But, but there's no paper material because I've I've looked I've gone through the the city what have I've gone through the county I think and I've got and I was going through the California State General Election book so it's not in either one of those you're I, saying I think there was a a secondary booklet sent out as uh, well that says okay. supplemental voter information so I got oh. that book booklet you're holding up for the general i got a sample ballot and i got another booklet that said supplemental for measures blah 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 blah, blah. Ah, perfect. Oh, okay I'll, <laughs> I'll look for that and the arguments are presented at the back of the sample ballot as well yeah and uh actually with that uh i should note that there's no paid opposition campaign to this as well so i no, mean on the howard jarvis again yeah, I was going to say on the ballot that it's like Howard Jarvis, but there isn't like an actual paid campaign to to shoot this down. And um, a lot of organizations that are like business uh, forward, we've been able to for for groups that you would maybe assume would be against it. We've actually been able to just like neutralize them like so they, they have a neutral position. Some actually have endorsed. So. Yeah, any any other questions? <laughs> Andrea, you, you mentioned um, that uh, La Casa will speed up housing. Can you talk about what how, how that's done? Do, do, do you know? I'm... Yeah, so um, with affordable housing, um, I mean, the way that it the way that affordable housing is funded for for those that aren't too familiar in, in that world. Um, it's really clunky. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's it's a matter of seeking different developers, different developers that have, you know, different uh, needs or things that they want included, um, you know, different tax credits, all of these different things that can really speed up or sorry, slow down. <laughs> it can really slow down the process. Um, and by doing that, by, you know, it, it adds time, it, which, you know, it adds cost as well, especially if you have to redraw plans and all of these things. But by having a single source of financing, it kind of cuts through all of that. And so um, the ability to just be able to build, it would be much faster and at a much lower cost because of that. You wouldn't have to have the whole rigmarole of, you know, coordinating with like eight or nine or 10 different funders, different developers, which is the case for a lot of um, a lot of places. And I and I, you know, I, I feel like maybe you or, or Jill or Anthony could maybe share a little on that and your experience of, you know, how projects can take longer because of things like that. Oh, so so it's it's helping put the funding together. Is that mm -hmm. what you're saying? So like, yeah. um, it, it would, it would put together the measure a funding with low income housing tax credits and the, the other sources of funding. Or itself would like the agency itself would be funding the project. So oh, I see. measure a is creating revenue for La Casa, which is um, the Los Angeles County affordable housing solutions agency. It passed uh, by Cal uh, in 2021 uh, due thanks to California legislators. For folks okay. that aren't familiar, yeah. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I need to learn more about that. I've been hearing about it, but I've not really focused on it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's going to hopefully help um, build a lot more because yeah, we have over five hundred thousand uh, units that we need. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions before we go on to Prop Thirty Three? Okay, so let's move on to Prop 33. So uh, B. Rooney, uh, also known as Bridget Rooney, but we call her B. Those of us who love her call her B, uh, <laughs> is a member of a uh, member organizer with the Pasadena Tenants Union. Uh, B. originally came to Southern California from the Midwest to pursue a PhD in environmental engineering and science at Caltech. 
She did that. And then with her degree in hand, she threw herself into the Pasadena campaign for rent control and eviction protections. Uh, she was on the steering committee for the Pasadena rent control campaign and acted as field director once the initiative secured its place on the ballot. So she knows a lot about rent control. So she's going to tell us about uh, Prop 33. B, welcome and take it away. Thank you, Bert. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, and thank you, Andrea, for that great presentation. I think I have a little bit easier of a job as Prop 33 is simply a repeal. Um, but let me open up my little presentation here and get into it. Uh, let's go. One second, gotta operate. All right. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I'm using a, an attached mic. Okay. It seems like it's good. All right. So Proposition 33, this is another thing on your ballot this year. Um, it is a California statewide proposition. Um, moral of the story, vote yes, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> All right. So uh, Prop 33 um, is actually a total repeal of another uh, law that currently exists called Costa Hawkins. So I'll explain what Costa Hawkins is as well, but the language in Prop 33 is therefore, therefore very straightforward. It says basically that the state may not limit the right of any city or county to maintain, enact, or expand residential rent control. The rest of the language just says repeal this section, repeal that section, repeal everything from Costa Hawkins, which is currently um, section 1954 of the Civil Code. All right, so Casa Hawkins um, is an act originally passed in 1995 uh, by legislature, not by the voters. And it does a few primary things. It bans, oops, excuse me, bans rent control um, or certain types of rent control, um, including rent control on uh, any housing built after 1995. It also bans rent control on condos or single family homes where there's, you know, one residential unit on the lot. Uh, additionally, it bans vacancy control, um, which is a term that means like regulating the rent increases between tenants, between different tenancies. Um, and so what this does is uh, it significantly hinders the long term impacts of rent control because while someone's living in a unit, they have a small increase year after year that's regulated by rent control. Um, as soon as they move out, the landlord can then do whatever they want to the rent to make a new rent price for the, the new tenant. And it kind of uh, removes all that progress we had made um, by stabilizing the rents for that period of one tenant. Um, also, the Casa Hawkins Act, the other bans that it has um, kind of further diminish rent control by, uh, you know, over time, since new buildings aren't subject to rent control, um, those might be more preferred to build more new construction and tear down old rent control buildings. Um, it contributes to gentrification. And off, also, you'll maybe have noticed this trend of more and more corporations buying up single family homes, these normal kind of family residencies in neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, basically it bans a lot of rent control and uh, removes all the power that cities and counties have from enacting their own local regulations. All right, so a little bit more on, on Casa Hawkins in the first place. Uh, like I said, it was um, enacted in 1995, um, not by a vote of the people, and it was uh, written by Alec. Um, I hope everyone here has heard of Alec before. If not, they are um, a lobbying, a right wing lobbying group that is behind all of the major terrible laws or, or uh, failures of new laws. Um, uh, things that, um, you know, lead to tax cuts, loosening of environmental protections, uh, uh, enacting anti immigrant measures and restricting voting rights, um, lax gun laws. Uh, increased incarceration, greatly contributing to the war on drugs. So those guys wrote Costa Hawkins um, and got it passed as a response to um, some cities in California that had recently passed very strong rent control, like Berkeley, West Hollywood, and Santa Monica. 
Hey, B, um, we had a request for you to uh, turn up your volume or maybe just get closer to your mic. Yeah, let me see. If, is this better if it's right there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Was what I said before, like, at all able to be heard or? <laughs> yeah, I could, I could hear most of it. I just, I think it depends on people's okay. computers, but that is definitely better. It was a little bit soft for me, but I could hear it all. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll stay right here. Thank you. Um, if you feel like you're having a little bit of deja vu, um, hearing about Prop 33, uh, you're right. Um, there have been two other attempts to partially or totally repeal Casa Hawkins in previous years. Um, so that was Prop 10 in 2018 and Prop 21 in 2020. Um, they've all been funded by the AIDS Healthcare Foundation um, and put on the ballot by them. Uh, while those lost overall in the state, um, Pasadena, the city of Pasadena voted, has voted consistently on these efforts to repeal Casa Hawkins. Um, you'll probably remember Pasadena voted for our rent control law. Um, there have been many polls and other tenant laws that Pasadena has always been in favor of. Um, so we love rent control. <laughs> we want to keep it. Um, and additionally, uh, Casa Hawkins is part of a, a, a slate of similar uh, laws to limit or ban rent control across the country. Many states have enacted similar things. Um, the money is coming from the same place. Um, and just in California in the past few years, um, more than $230 million has been spent on those political campaign contributions and lobbying by giant private equity firms and uh, real estate investment trusts um, to squash any pro-tenant, any like really good housing laws. Um, so consistently the anti-tenant uh, campaigns have spent way uh, more money than the, the pro campaigns as well. And still Pasadena uh, voted for these sorts of repeals. All right, so what happens if Casa Hawkins is repealed? So again, that's a yes on Prop 33 leads to a repeal of Casa Hawkins. Um, it eliminates all the bans that were in place. So if Prop 33 passes, local authorities like the city and the county would be, be able to implement whatever kind of rent control regulations that they want to. Um, many rent control laws that are currently place, in place would automatically expand to cover more units. That does depend on the specific law language of those regulations. Um, Pasadena has language that says very explicitly, if Casa Hawkins is repealed, if the state law changes, this law automatically applies to the fullest extent that it can. Um, so more on that later. And additionally, this means that vacancy control is no longer banned. And so there could be regulations in place, um, put in place to, to regulate the rent increases between tenancies. Um, so Casa Hawkins has been one of the biggest uh, uh, threats to rent control and barriers to having effective long-term rent control. Um, and so getting rid of it would really provide us a lot of freedom to strengthen what we already have. And so in, in Pasadena specifically, we have um, a different Measure H, <laughs> Measure H from 2022, uh, and that's our rent control and eviction protection law for the city. Um, because of Casa Hawkins, Pasadena rent control does not uh, apply to units built after 1995. It does not apply to single family homes and it doesn't apply to condos. However, it's written so that if Casa Hawkins is repealed, as soon as it's no more, all of these uh, types of units would automatically be covered. So as soon as Prop 33 passes, um, uh, rent control would apply to a lot more buildings in Pasadena. Um, additionally, it would allow the Rental Housing Board to implement vacancy control, which um, I think a, a number of the people currently on the board would be interested in such a thing. And I know the Tenants Union and a lot of other folks would probably uh, want to lobby to employ some sort of vacancy control because it, it really just diminishes the power of rent control if you can't control it between tenancies. Um, yeah, so overall, it'd be really great for Pasadena immediately um, and over the longer term, really allow cities to figure out good rent control plans for uh, their locality. 
Um, so some information on the funders and endorsers. This is just a little sample. Um, the folks uh, who are yes on Prop 33 include obviously the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Um, they also funded and, and endorsed the Pasadena rent control campaign. Many of the Democratic parties, uh, the chapters and clubs, uh, the ACLU, a lot of labor unions, including the nurses and teachers, um, lots of housing advocates and nonprofit organizations, a bunch of community organizations, the county of LA itself, um, and all sorts of politicians uh, have endorsed or uh, funded this measure. Um, on the no side, it's landlords and realtors, primarily the California Apartment Association. Um, they've raised like over $38 million to kill the measure. Um, and actually the vast majority of the funding um, for to, to kill the measure is from just 11 uh, corporate landlords, just 11. Um, it's all the same people. It's Graystar, it's Equity, it's, it's these groups. Um, additionally, the California Association of Realtors, uh, the California Republican Party um, have also endorsed the no on Prop 33. Um, it's pretty clear from the funding and endorsements alone, like who this is for and who it's not for. Um, it would be really awesome for tenants if this passes once and for all. Um, a special note as well, this has a weird connection to Prop 34. So um, Proposition 34, also on this ballot, is um, it, it's... Uh, put out there in a very sneaky disguised way. The text of the measure essentially limits um, how much money certain healthcare entities and nonprofits could spend on political issues. But the way it's phrased, it's like hard to, to tease that out of there. Um, but this uh, measure was also majority funded by the California Apartment Association. And it is specifically to prevent the AIDS Healthcare Foundation from really funding housing initiatives on the ballot again. Um, it's like a direct revenge tactic because AHF has done this three times now. They have a lot of money um, and they, that they put forward for housing initiatives even though they fail. The Apartment Association recognizes them as a threat to the, uh, their future profits. And so they're trying to get around this with some sneaky laws that would say AHF can't give money to measures like this. Um, so that's a quick sidebar. I would say vote no on 34 because it prevents the future funding of similar initiatives. Um, but a quick review, Costa Hawkins diminishes the efforts uh, to prevent evictions and stabilize rents. It limits the power of cities and counties to enact their own regulations. Um, where yes on three, 33 would repeal Casa Hawkins. It would give power back to local authorities. It would eliminate the single greatest barrier to um, effective rent control. And it would expand rental con rent control coverage to thousands of more units in Pasadena. So vote yes on 33 and get rid of Casa Hawkins. <laughs> Um, and that's basically it. Uh, the yeson33.org website has um, ways that you can get plugged in. Um, it's a long time com coming. Hopefully, hopefully it'll pass. But uh, I think their campaign could could use some help. Um, and if there's time for questions, I'm happy to answer what I can. Excellent. Thank you, B. Um, yeah. So yes on 33, no on 34 is what we're saying here. 34 is a Trojan horse. Uh, but yeah, so uh, raise your hand if you have a question. Blair? Hi, thank you so much for taking the time to make the presentation. This was really helpful. Um, one of the things I've been confused about in the, um, the voter guide, uh, they say that the measure could effectively overturn more than 100 state housing laws, including laws making it easier to build affordable housing and fair housing and tenant eviction protections. Do you have any idea what they're talking about? Um, no, I, I mean, definitely the last part of that sentence where they're saying tenant eviction and protections, I think that's just a straight up lie. I think yeah. the first part about affordable housing 
I think probably because of the um, par particularly the, uh, you know, nothing new after 1995 can be covered. If that's repealed, they use that as an argument to mean that like any new construction, including the affordable housing is just not going to be motivated because now it has to be rent controlled. I don't think it's based in factual analysis. Um, this is, <laughs> you know, the way of the CAA, like if you look into the, the Prop 34 campaign, um, they just cover it in this huge mask of lies to, you know, misdirect people. Got it. Okay. And then, sorry, just um, the Housing Action Coalition, which is actually a pretty good group, is is listed in the ballot materials as opposing Prop 33. I can't find anything on their website that says anything about that. So I'm super confused yeah. as to why they're opposing it. Sure. You said Housing Action Coalition? Action Coalition, yeah. Okay. I am not sure if I'm actually familiar with them. Um, or, and you're sure this is a... a it's, yeah, it's absolutely not one of these um, 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 AstroTurf groups. They've been around right, for But they didn't decades. just create, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I know them well from working. I was an affordable housing developer in the Bay Area for 20 years. And they're like a thoroughly normal, good, decent group. So I just I'm I'm like totally mystified and I also sure. but I'm also intrigued by the fact that like there's no information on their website about it. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. just I don't get it. It's it's basically a coalition of um like a lot of the um af like affordable housing developers and then some of the market rate housing developers that actually do some affordable housing. That's who it is. So I'm really confused. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I'm, unfortunately I'm not really familiar with this group, but my guess would be that they've uh, believed the arguments that if you have rent control on any new construction, that it's going to diminish their efforts to build new affordable housing. Um, uh, okay. But I just, I, yeah, I just, I hear this argument, but I don't understand it. And I, of course, you're not on that side. So asking you to explain <laughs> that is like super yeah. not fair, but you know, this is the first forum I've been invited to. So I'll try and find sure. somebody else. No, that's, down that's, by it. that's a great question and a, a really good reason to, to look into yeah. what they're doing. So yeah, I was just really surprised to see them on the list of, of folks opposed. So I'll, f I'll figure it out. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, no problem. All right. Jill has her hand up. Yeah, thank you for this great presentation, B. Um, I I am wondering. Um, I know that this this doesn't require rent control anywhere. It just gives our cities and jurisdictions opportunity if that's what they want to to create, craft an ordinance. But um, as far as the rolling uh, kind of like I know other previous years they would have like a rolling fifteen years. Um, or older would then it would apply to that group, um, and, you know, the, that housing to be allowed to be rent controlled. But um, right. but this this is clear it includes even new construction. Is that is that the case? Um, so yeah, that's actually something I forgot to include. Um, so I think you're kind of alluding to AB fourteen eighty two, which is the state. Um, it's more of a anti rent gouging than a real rent control, but. Um, the state uh, measure has um, an exemption, so rent control doesn't apply to buildings built in the last 15 years on a rolling basis. So kind of thinking of that really recent new construction wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be covered by rent control, but after 15 years, it would fall under that. Um, so yeah, I think that's actually correct that if Casa Hawkins is repealed, um, you know what I think actually I think because the way it's that's that's a great question I need to double check on that but I believe because of the way um, it's phrased that Casa Hawkins like limits what cities can do but if it that's taken away then the city can do what something that would even trump AB 1482 um, so I'm pretty sure the way it stands is all construction 
including the past 15 years, at least for Pasadena, if Casa Hawkins is repealed, would be covered. But that's something I need to double check the language on because that is a great question. But, but, but cities could craft an ordinance to say they want a rolling just for the yeah, last. Yep. Season. Yeah. So, it yeah. So cities, cities would be able to. to yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yeah. It doesn't that enact. Sense to me, it really shouldn't apply to recent new construction. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Prop 33 only repeals anything in place. So, if a city doesn't already have a rolling time frame or something, they have to go through the political process to establish that. It doesn't just automatically appear. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's a great question. Anthony has his hand up. Yeah, so I really <clears throat> appreciate what you've said and I do support Prop 33, but I am concerned that if it does pass, that we'll have one of the most um, comprehensive red control in the, certainly in the state because it'll be new construction will be included and rent con decontrol will be taken away so that uh is that correct um yes so de okay. vacancy decontrol would be removed yeah meaning the rental housing board could put in place could put that in place regulations so, between tenancies yeah so one of the major arguments opposing prop 33 is that it would stifle development and so this would be kind of an experiment to see if that is in fact the case. And if in Pasadena it turns out that that in the next five to ten years, uh, very few new developments are built, or if it turns out that a lot of apartment buildings are converted to, well, I guess they would be converted to condos. What is the um, what's the plan for the rent rental board? Is it that they thought that through? Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know what the rental board is, is thinking about at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you mentioned like the potential conversion to condos. If Casa Hawkins is repealed, that conversion to condos no longer benefits, um, the, the property owners because condos okay. would now be included, um, by rent control. Um, as far as discouraging new construction, um, I haven't really been, I, I understand the basic thought there. I haven't been totally convinced primarily because I don't think that's the main hindrance um, of why we don't have affordable units. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of come at it more from the like, we have, um, we currently have more empty units than homeless people. So I'm almost, uh, I'm in a different camp than a lot of the folks that are uh, working really hard on building affordable units, which I'm generally for, but um, I kind of see the problem a little bit differently. Uh, I think that definitely in Pasadena, I think a lot of places would want to contend with a potential uh, rolling period like the state law to allow for new construction. I think that's a that's a widespread opinion now is that some sort of time frame of recent or new construction needs to be exempt uh, to make sure there's still some uh, desire to actually build that. That wasn't a really great answer for you, but. Um... <laughs> well, it's, it's an experiment. You know, we won't know yeah. until it's tried. And my question, yeah, I mean, if it because, turns out yeah. to be um, something that really stifles development, um, what's the remedy? And I guess at this point, we'll have to wait and see. Because, yeah, and I, I think the, we've. I think, missed out on uh, you know almost three decades of experimenting with housing regulation because of Casa Hawkins. Mm -hmm. You know we haven't been able to actually really try, you know the maximum or a variety of things because of the current limitations. So um, Heather Richardson asked a question, and I think Heather, are you still on? Yeah, um, Heather, can you um, can you speak into the mic and ask your question? You're, you're muted right now. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read the question. I just didn't want to, um, it says, with passing of Prop 33, who would be exempt based on it? Uh, measure H and 
AB 1482. Yeah, so... Um, I think this is similar to Jill's question earlier yeah. where I need to double check the language. Um, but just a reminder that Prop 33 removes any exemptions. It makes it basically a blank slate. Um, measure H uh, currently is limited by Casa Hawkins so that things built after 1995 cannot be covered by rent control. If that is removed, either it's going to be things... Uh, built up until the last 15 years or to very current day would be totally covered. But I, I need to confirm that. And I'm going to look into that tonight and maybe I can email Bert. So you guys, you can update okay. everyone since I totally forgot about that one piece, which is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, you're not the only one. Yeah. Someone else told me that measure H has a trigger that would cause every unit in Pasadena to be rent controlled. Um, yeah. So, um, all right. Any other, any other questions for, for B? Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do now is do a brief presentation on measure R. Second, I just want to thank B and really appreciate your commitment to rent control in our city. The tenants union is doing terrific work and has been Really, uh, and we'll see what happens. It's it's uh, it, you've you've uh, I think it will benefit renters in this city very much, and I appreciate the work you're doing in that in that area. Awesome, thanks, Anthony. Yeah, and thank you guys, you specifically, and but everyone in this group. I know your org helped a lot yeah. to get it passed in the first place. So it's been awesome, and keep up your your guys' good work. Thanks. thanks. And I should have I should have thanked Andrea for her presentation. Yeah. Day. Andrea's left. Uh, she had to go. So thank you, Andrea. I'll I'll tell her in person. But yeah, B, thanks for that. That was a great presentation. Thanks and yeah, oh, yeah. Thanks for all the work you and the uh, tenants union have done. It's incredible work. Um, yeah, I, uh, Jill and I were involved in the first attempt way back twenty years ago. We got nowhere uh, with rent control, but um, uh, so we really appreciate that. We were it was an honor to work on the campaign. Um, so I'm going to, uh, share my screen here and talk about measure R, uh, right. Slide show. So measure R is a general obligation bond for the construction of, uh, and renovation for, for renovation and construction of POSD sites. So, um, you often see it uh, paired with Measure EE. I'm not going to talk about Measure EE. Measure EE is a straight up tax, and that will be used for salaries for peop for employees of PUSD. It actually can be used for anything, but it, the the plan is to use it for for for, for salaries for for wages. Uh, but the me Measure R is for facilities. So uh, first, let's look at the numbers. It's a 900 million dollar bond but it will qualify for state matching funds. Um, so it could potentially double. Um, and it will be paid for with a tax on all taxable property, residential and commercial in the district. So if you're a homeowner, uh, it's estimated uh, average annual tax rate is gonna be less than $59 per $100,000 of assessed valuation. Um, so what that means is this it, you'll be you'll be taxed not on your market rate value, not on what your home is necessarily worth in the market right now, but what it was uh, what it was assessed at when it was assessed. So if you have owned your if you bought your home twenty years ago and that's the last time it was assessed, then it's gonna they're gonna use that amount, or if it's thirty years ago, whatever whenever you bought it. So that assessed value. Every hundred thousand dollars of of that value, you multiply that times fifty nine, and that'll be the absolute most that you can be taxed within any year. Uh, because of the way uh, property taxes work in California, because of Prop thirteen and uh, the the um, Howard Jarvis uh, tax people, um, this is going to fall hardest on um, more recent homeowners uh, like myself. Uh, I'm I'm effectively a, a recent homeowner because we bought our condo two years ago and 
uh, there was a, it was, it was, it was assessed at that point. Um, uh, but I'm I'm planning to vote for this, even though it's going to be it's going to be fall hardest on me because the schools really need this. So um, what it's going to do, it's going to repair or replace leaky roofs and plumbing. It's going to repair um, uh, replace inefficient electrical heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, and deterior deteriorating portable classrooms. Um, Anybody involved with PUSD at this point knows that the, the facilities are in really, really bad shape. Um, so they really need a lot of, uh, of fixing up. That's probably the number one reason we need this. Uh, but it will also expand programs uh, in coding, robotics, engineering, health sciences, creative arts, and computer science. Um, because it can be used to buy uh, like tablets and stuff like that, uh, 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 equipment for the students and also it will update classroom technology wireless networks infrastructure and also compliance with ada so it's going to do all of that that is the main reason for for it but a small portion of it is going to be used for affordable housing and that's why i'm talking about it um so um it's the the affordable housing that's going to be used for that they're talking about right now will be prioritized for staff and their families. And I say it's prioritized because um, if if not enough staff apply for it, then other people can apply for it. But it's it's unlikely that will happen. There's a, the staff really need housing. Um, we have, uh, as I, I was saying in my uh, other presentation, um, there are staff that barely make them ab above minimum wage. Uh, we heard this last year, there were a couple of janitors living in their cars. There are staff that are having to commute from far away. So um, staff really need this housing. Uh, the current configuration is 115 units, uh, anywhere from one to four bedrooms, and a mix of income levels. And this is very important because um, mixing income levels, we, we need more integration. The history of integration in the United States is one of segregation, and it has not served us well. Uh, segregation separates us. It uh, it makes it's it makes it, it in a separated a uh, a uh, uh, society where people are separated uh, by class and race and other things um, is a weak society. So we need integration, but it's going to have a lot of affordability. The lowest um, uh, priced units will be six hundred dollars a month, and there will be fifty five units that will be fifteen hundred dollars or less per month. Uh, so it goes from there all the way up to, I think, uh, in the 4,000s for the uh, some of the four bedrooms. Um, and by the way, it's it's not completely according to how many bedrooms as to whether they're lower or higher. So it's not just one bedrooms that go for 600. I think there's some two and three bedrooms that are going to go for six, uh, 600. Um, so it really mixes it, mixes it up. So you have uh, a real mix of income levels living uh, among the units. So this is the current configuration we're we're looking at. This this could change, but that is what they're looking at. So um, that's what measure R is. Um, and let's see, any questions about measure R? If you could use your raise hand emoji, or if you can't figure out how to use that, by the way, I, I realize some people may not be able to find it, then just um, you can maybe wave at us or something. <laughs> Um, but Carolyn, yeah. Yes. How does this compare to this proposition too, that bonds for schools and community and colleges? Yeah, legislation. That's, yeah, that's a state level. So this okay. one is uh, passing for for this one will be um, on for the Pasadena Unified School District, which includes Altadena and Sierra Madre. Uh, but uh, Prop Two, I've, I've forgotten which one that was. Thanks for reminding me. It's Prop Two. I get that's the the state level one. And my understanding is that's not a property tax. It is a tax, but not a property tax. Both of them are bonds. Yeah, I was going to say this is this one is a bond. Yeah. But, but I wrote something down about Roosevelt. What what did remember? Someone was talking about that. Yeah, yeah. So the the housing, the staff housing that they're talking about right now is going to be at Rose at the old Roosevelt school site. Uh -huh. uh, you, you know where Roosevelt is? Yes. Yeah. So that one was closed in 2019. 
So the school board this past year has voted twice, six to one, to move forward with affordable staff housing at Roosevelt. Yeah, so they're, they're going to tear down and build from the bottom up, by the way. It's not a renovation. So does Measure R have anything to do with that kind of construction or reconfiguration? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Measure R. Yeah, yeah. So the whole, the idea is that it will be funded by Measure R. It's going to be a small okay. portion of Measure R. Um, like uh, I should have looked at the percentages. I think it's going to be like seven or eight percent of Measure R. So most of Measure R will be spent on other things. Okay. And I say that because somebody today said a big part of it will be for affordable housing. Well, no, actually, a small part will be for affordable housing. But okay. at, least, at least the plans right now. But at this point, they are planning to build 115 units at Roosevelt. Um, but there is talk of if that's successful, they may go on. So they may they may use you know more of it for affordable housing than than we're thinking. But at least that one um, development at Roosevelt is 115 units. Did you mention Bert that they that that the school would recoup almost all of its money or maybe even make money on this project? Yeah, good point. Um, the feasibility study done a year ago actually showed the county, I mean, the, the school district coming a, getting coming ahead out of this project like $43 million. Um, now it looks like it'll break even, um, but what that is showing, the feasibility, the latest feasibility on this shows that uh, it will pay for itself. It won't make more money. The, the feasibility study from a year ago said that it will not only pay for itself, but uh, the district will actually get $43 million more. This is over 30 years, by the way. Is um, that because of the family units that they have? Yeah, I think that it's partially it's they reconfigured it to include more family units because the old feasibility study had majority single uh, uh, single bedroom units. Part of it's that, and part of it's just over the past year, construction costs have gone up. Everything's gone up. And just the, the numbers from a year ago just don't work anymore. Any other questions? What kind of pushback is there right now on this? I think the main pushback is uh, sort of sticker shock. Um, from all the bonds that are on the ballot and all the taxes that are on the ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the main thing. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> there there is a small group of people that is hoping to reopen Roosevelt School. But if you talk to anybody in the district, they say that's just not going to happen. Um, there's no way it's going to be that Roosevelt would ever be reopened. I mean, not within mm -hmm. you know our lifetimes or whatever. Yeah, $59 isn't that much, you know, for... Hundred uh, uh, hundred thousand valuation. It's very recent. I, think, I yeah. think the objections that I've heard have to do with the fact that the school district hasn't always done the best job at managing their facilities, and so there's some concern that this project won't go as well as it should. Mm. Yeah, I think I've heard that too. There hasn't been when we've gone to the the school board. Uh, there hasn't always been a lot of opposition. There's been some, but there's not been a lot of opposition. We, we, we've we usually uh, outnumbered the opposition, even when we only had two or three people there. Yeah. Um, any any uh, other questions? Great presentation, Bert. Thank you for that. Sure, sure. I, I've forgotten that I covered some of it in the earlier presentation. <laughs> yeah, so it's, we need to hear it again. No problem. I didn't. I, I need it anyway. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming uh, tonight, and um, and I hope yeah, I hope people learned a lot. And um, excellent. So um, we will. I don't know when we'll having be having our next housing justice forum, but we will let everybody know. And thank you for coming and, and, and have a good night. Thank you all. Thank good you. to see you all. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good to see you. <laughs>